Chapter sixty two, part one of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume six, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter sixty two Greek Emperors of Nice and Constantinople, part one. The Greek Emperors of Nice and Constantinople. Elevation and reign of Michael Paleologus, his false union with the Pope and the Latin Church, hostile designs of Charles of Anjou, revolt of Sicily, war of the Catalans in Asia and Greece, revolutions and present state of Athens. The loss of Constantinople restored a momentary vigor to the Greeks. From their palaces, princes and nobles were driven into the field and the fragments of the falling monarchy were grasped by the hands of the most vigorous or the most skilful candidates. In the long and barren pages of the Byzantine annals, it would not be an easy task to equal the two characters of Theodore Lascaris and John Ducas Vatices, who replanted and upheld the Roman standard at Nice in Bithynia. The difference of their virtues was happily situated to the diversity of their situation, in his first efforts, the fugitive Lascaris commanded only three cities and two thousand soldiers. His reign was the season of generous and active despair. In every military operation he staked his life and crown, and his enemies of the Hellespont and the Meander were surprised by his celerity and subdued by his boldness. A victorious reign of eighteen years expanded the principality of Nice to the magnitude of an empire. The throne of his successor and son-in-law, Vatices, was founded on a more solid basis, a larger scope, and more plentiful resources, and it was the temper, as well as the interest, of Vatices to calculate the risk, to expect the moment, and to ensure the success of his ambitious designs. In the decline of the Latins I have briefly exposed the progress of the Greeks, the prudent and gradual advances of a conqueror, who in a reign of thirty-three years rescued the provinces from natural and foreign usurpers, till he pressed on all sides the imperial city, a leafless and sapless trunk, which must full at the first stroke of the axe. But his interior and peaceful administration is still more deserving of notice and praise. The calamities of the times had wasted the numbers and the substance of the Greeks. The motives and the means of agriculture were extirpated, and the most fertile lands were left without cultivation or inhabitants. A portion of this vacant property was occupied and improved by the command, and for the benefit of the emperor. A powerful hand and a vigilant eye supplied and surpassed, by a skilful management, the minute diligence of a private farmer. The royal domain became the garden and granary of Asia, and without impoverishing the people, the sovereign acquired a fund of innocent and productive wealth. According to the nature of the soil, his lands were sown with corn or planted with vines, the pastures were filled with horses and oxen, with sheep and hogs, and when Vatices presented to the empress a crown of diamonds and pearls, he informed her with a smile that this precious ornament arose from the sale of the eggs of his innumerable poultry. The produce of his domain was applied to the maintenance of his palace and hospitals, the calls of dignity and benevolence. The lesson was still more useful than the revenue. The plough was restored to its ancient security and honour, and the nobles were taught to seek a sure and independent revenue from their estates, instead of adorning their splendid beggary by the oppression of the people, or, what is almost the same, by the favours of the court. The superfluous stock of corn and cattle was eagerly purchased by the Turks, with whom Vatices preserved a strict and sincere alliance, but he discouraged the importation of foreign manufactures, the costly silks of the East, and the curious labours of the Italian looms. The demands of nature and necessity, was he accustomed to say, are indispensable, but the influence of fashion may rise and sink at the breath of a monarch, and both his precept and example recommended simplicity of manners and the use of domestic industry. The education of youth and the revival of learning were the most serious objects in his care, and, without deciding the precedency, he pronounced with truth, that a prince and a philosopher are the two most eminent characters of human society. His first wife was Irene, the daughter of Theodore Lascaris, a woman more illustrious by her personal merit, the milder virtues of her sex, than by the blood of the Angeli and the Comini that flowed in her veins, 
and transmitted the inheritance of the empire. After her death he was contracted to Anne, or Constance, a natural daughter of the Emperor Frederick II. But as the bride had not attained the years of puberty, Vatices placed in his solitary bed an Italian damsel of her train, and his amorous weakness bestowed on the concubine the honours, though not the title, of a lawful empress. His frailty was censured as a flagitious and damnable sin by the monks, and their rude invectives exercised and displayed the patience of the royal lover. A philosophic age may excuse a single vice, which was redeemed by a crowd of virtues, and in the review of his faults, and in the more intemperate passions of Lascaris, the judgment of their contemporaries was softened by gratitude to the second founders of the empire. The slaves of the Latins, without law or peace, applauded the happiness of their brethren who had resumed their national freedom, and Vatices employed the laudable policy of convincing the Greeks, of every dominion, that it was their interest to be enrolled in the number of his subjects. A strong shade of degeneracy is visible between John Vatices and his son Theodore, between the founder who sustained the weight, and the heir who enjoyed the splendor of the imperial crown. Yet the character of Theodore was not devoid of energy. He had been educated in the school of his father, in the exercise of war and hunting. Constantinople was yet spared, but in the three years of a short reign, he thrice led his armies into the heart of Bulgaria. His virtues were sullied by a choleric and suspicious temper. The first of these may be ascribed to the ignorance of control, and the second might naturally arise from a dark and imperfect view of the corruption of mankind. On a march in Bulgaria, he consulted on a question of policy his principal ministers, and the Greek Yogotheti, George Acropolita, presumed to offend him by the declaration of a free and honest opinion. The emperor half unsheathed his scimitar, but his more deliberate rage reserved Acropolita for a baser punishment. One of the first officers of the empire was ordered to dismount, stripped of his robes, and extended on the ground in the presence of the prince and army. In this posture he was chastised with so many and such heavy blows from the clubs of two guards or executioners, that when Theodore commanded them to cease, the great Yagotheti was scarcely able to rise and crawl away to his tent. After a seclusion of some days, he was recalled by a peremptory mandate to his seat in the council, and so dead were the Greeks to the sense of honour and shame, that it is from the narrative of the sufferer himself that we acquire the knowledge of his disgrace. The cruelty of the emperor was exasperated by the pangs of sickness, the approach of a premature end, and the suspicion of poison and magic. The lives and fortunes, the eyes and limbs of his kinsmen and nobles, were sacrificed to each sally of passion, and before he died the son of Vatices might deserve from the people, or at least from the court, the appellation of tyrant. A matron of the family of the Paleologi had provoked his anger by refusing to bestow her beauteous daughter on the vile plebeian who was recommended by his caprice. Without regard to her birth or age, her body, as high as the neck, was enclosed in a sack with several cats, who were pricked with pins to irritate their fury against their unfortunate fellow-captive. In his last hours the emperor testified a wish to forgive and be forgiven, a just anxiety for the fate of John, his son and successor, who at the age of eight years was condemned to the dangers of a long minority. His last choice entrusted the office of guardian to the sanctity of the patriarch Arsenius, and to the courage of George Muzalon, the great domestic, who was equally distinguished by the royal favour and the public hatred. Since their connection with the Latins, the names and privileges of hereditary rank had insinuated themselves into the Greek monarchy, and the noble families were provoked by the elevation of a worthless favourite, to whose influence they imputed the errors and calamities of the late reign. In the first council, after the emperor's death, Mazalon, from a lofty throne, pronounced a laboured apology of his conduct and intentions. His modesty was subdued by a unanimous assurance of esteem and fidelity, and his most inveterate enemies were the loudest to salute him as the guardian and saviour of the Romans. Eight days were sufficient to prepare the execution of the conspiracy. On the ninth, the obsequies of the deceased monarch were solemnized in the cathedral of Magnesia an Asiatic city, where he expired on the banks of the Hermus, and at the foot of Mount Sipolis. The holy rites were interrupted by a sedition of the guards. Mazalan, his brothers, and his inherents, were massacred at the foot of the altar, and the absent patriarch was associated with a new colleague, with Michael Paleologus, the most illustrious, in birth and merit, of the Greek nobles. <laughs>
Of those who are proud of their ancestors, the far greater part must be content with local or domestic renown, and few there are who dare trust the memorials of their family to the public annals of their country. As early as the middle of the eleventh century, the noble race of the Paleologi stands high and conspicuous in the Byzantine history. It was the valiant George Paleologus who placed the father of the Comini on the throne, and his kinsmen or descendants continue, in each generation, to lead the armies and councils of the state. The purple was not dishonoured by their alliance, and had the law of succession and female succession been strictly observed, the wife of Theodore Lascaris must have yielded to her elder sister, the mother of Michael Paleologus, who afterwards raised his family to the throne. In his person the splendour of birth was dignified by the merit of the soldier and statesman. In his early youth he was promoted to the office of constable or commander of the French mercenaries. The private expense of a day never exceeded three pieces of gold, but his ambition was rapacious and profuse, and his gifts were doubled by the graces of his conversation and manners. The love of the soldiers and people excited the jealousy of the court, and Michael thrice escaped from the dangers in which he was involved by his own imprudence or that of his friends. Under the reign of Justice and Vatices, a dispute arose between two officers, one of whom accused the other of maintaining the hereditary right of the Paleologi. The cause was decided, according to the new jurisprudence of the Latins, by single combat. The defendant was overthrown, but he persisted in declaring that himself alone was guilty, and that he had uttered these rash or treasonable speeches without the approbation or knowledge of his patron. Yet a cloud of suspicion hung over the innocence of the constable. He was still pursued by the whispers of malevolence, and a subtle courtier, the Archbishop of Philadelphia, urged him to accept the judgment of God in the fiery proof of the ordeal. Three days before the trial, the patient's arm was enclosed in a bag, and secured by the royal signet, and it was incumbent on him to bear a red-hot ball of iron three times from the altar to the rails of the sanctuary, without artifice and without injury. Paleologus eluded the dangerous experiment with sense and pleasantry. "'I am a soldier,' said he, "'and will boldly enter the list with my accusers. But a layman, a sinner like myself, is not endowed with the gift of miracles.' Your piety, most holy prelate, may deserve the interpossession of heaven, and from your hands I will receive the fiery globe, the pledge of my innocence. The archbishop started, the emperor smiled, and the absolution or pardon of Michael was approved by new rewards and new services. In the succeeding reign, as he held the government of Nice, he was secretly informed that the mind of the absent prince was poisoned with jealousy, and that death or blindness would be his final reward. Instead of awaiting the return and sentence of Theodore, the constable, with some followers, escaped from the city and the empire, and though he was plundered by the Turkmans of the desert, he found a hospitable refuge in the court of the sultan. In the ambiguous state of an exile, Michael reconciled the duties of gratitude and loyalty, drawing his sword against the Tartars, admonishing the garrisons of the Roman limit, and promoting, by his influence, the restoration of peace, in which his pardon and recall were honourably included. While he guarded the West against the despot of Epirus, Michael was again suspected and condemned in the palace, and such was his loyalty or weakness that he submitted to be led in chains above six hundred miles from Durazzo to Nice. The civility of the messenger alleviated his disgrace, the emperor's sickness dispelled his danger, and the last breath of Theodore, which recommended his infant son, at once acknowledged the innocence and the power of Paleologus. But his innocence had been too unworthily treated, and his power was too strongly felt, to curb an aspiring subject in the fair field that was open to his ambition. In the council, after the death of Theodore, he was the first to pronounce, and the first to violate, the oath of allegiance to Mazalon, and so dexterous was his conduct that he reaped the benefit, without incurring the guilt, or at least the reproach, of the subsequent massacre. In the choice of a regent he balanced the interests and passions of the candidates, turned their envy and hatred from himself against each other, and forced every competitor to own, that after his own claims, those of Paleologus were best entitled to the preference. Under the title of Great Duke, he accepted, or assumed, during a long minority, the active powers of government. The patriarch was a venerable name, and the factious nobles were seduced, or oppressed, by the ascendancy of his genius. The fruits of the economy of Vasites were deposited in a strong castle on the banks of the Hermus, 
in the custody of the faithful Varangians. The constable retained his command or influence over the foreign troops. He employed the guards to possess the treasure, and the treasure to corrupt the guards. And whatsoever might be the abuse of the public money, his character was above the suspicion of private avarice. By himself, or by his emissaries, he strove to persuade every rank of subjects, that their own prosperity would rise in just proportion to the establishment of his authority. The weight of taxes was suspended, the perpetual theme of popular complaint, and he prohibited the trials by the ordeal and judicial combat. These barbaric institutions were already abolished or undermined in France and England, and the appeal to the sword offended the sense of a civilized, and the temper of an unwarlike people. For the future maintenance of their wives and children, the veterans were grateful. The priests and philosophers applauded his ardent zeal for the advancement of religion and learning, and his vague promise of rewarding merit was applied by every candidate to his own hopes. Conscious of the influence of the clergy, Michael successfully labored to secure the suffrage of that powerful order. Their expensive journey from Nice to Magnesia afforded a decent and ample pretense. The leading prelates were tempted by the liberality of his nocturnal visits, and the incorruptible patriarch was flattered by the homage of his new colleague, who led his mule by the bridle into town, and removed to a respectful distance the importunity of the crowd. Without renouncing his title by royal descent, Paleologus encouraged a free discussion to the advantages of elective monarchy, and his adherents asked, with the insolence of triumph, what patient would trust his health, or what merchant would abandon his vessel, to the hereditary skill of a physician or a pilot. The youth of the emperor, and the impending dangers of a minority, required the support of a mature and experienced guardian, of an associate raised above the envy of his equals, and invested with the name and prerogatives of royalty. For the interest of the prince and people, without any selfish views for himself or his family, the great duke consented to guard and instruct the son of Theodore, but he sighed for the happy moment when he might restore to his firmer hands the administration of his patrimony, and enjoy the blessings of a private station. He was first invested with the title and prerogatives of despot, which bestowed the purple ornaments and the second place in the Roman monarchy. It was afterwards agreed that John and Michael should be proclaimed as joint emperors, and raised on the buckler, but that the preeminence should be reserved for the birthright of the former. A mutual league of amity was pledged between the royal partners, and in case of a rupture the subjects were bound, by their oath of allegiance, to declare themselves against the aggressor, an ambiguous name, the seat of discord and civil war. Paleologus was content, but on the day of the coronation, and in the cathedral of Nice, his zealous adherents most vehemently urged the just priority of his age and merit. The unseasonable dispute was eluded by postponing to a more convenient opportunity the coronation of John Lascaris, and he walked with the slight diadem in the trail of his guardian, who alone received the imperial crown from the hands of the patriarch. It was not without extreme reluctance that Arsenius abandoned the cause of his pupil, out the Varangians brandished their battle-axes, a sign of assent was extorted from the trembling youth, and some voices were heard, that the life of a child should no longer impede the settlement of the nation. A full harvest of honors and employments was distributed among his friends by the grateful Paleologus. In his own family he created a despot and two Sebastocrators. Alexis Strategopolis was decorated with the title of Caesar, and that veteran commander soon repaid the obligation by restoring Constantinople to the Greek emperor. It was in the second year of his reign, while he resided in the palace and gardens of Nymphaeum, near Smyrna, that the first messenger arrived at the dead of night, and the stupendous intelligence was imparted to Michael, after he had been gently waked by the tender precaution of his sister Eulogia. The man was unknown or obscure. He produced no letters from the victorious Caesar, nor could it easily be credited, after the defeat of Vasites and the recent failure of Paleologus himself, that the capital had been surprised by a detachment of eight hundred soldiers. As a hostage the doubtful author was confined, with the assurance of death or an ample recompense, and the court was left some hours in the anxiety of hope and fear, till the messengers of Alexius arrived with the authentic intelligence, and displayed the trophies of the conquest, the sword and the sceptre, the buskins and bonnet, of the usurper Baldwin, which he had dropped in his precipitate flight. A general assembly of the bishops, senators, and nobles was immediately convened, and never, perhaps, was an event received with more heartfelt and universal joy. 
In a studied oration, the new sovereign of Constantinople congratulated his own and the public fortune. There was a time, said he, a far distant time, when the Roman Empire extended to the Adriatic, the Tigris, and the confines of Ethiopia. After the loss of the provinces, our capital itself, in these last and calamitous days, has been wrested from our hands by the barbarians of the West. From the lowest ebb, the tide of prosperity has again returned in our favour, but our prosperity was that of fugitives and exiles, and when we were asked which was the country of the Romans, we indicated with a blush the climate of the globe and the quarter of the heavens. The divine providence has now restored to our arms the city of Constantine, the sacred seat of religion and empire, and it will depend on our valour and conduct to render this important acquisition the pledge and omen of future victories. So eager was the impatience of the prince and people, that Michael made his triumphal entry into Constantinople only twenty days after the expulsion of the Latins. The golden gate was thrown open at his approach, the devout conqueror dismounted from his horse, and a miraculous image of Mary the conductress was borne before him, that divine virgin in person might appear to conduct him to the temple of her son, the cathedral of St. Sophia. But after the first transport of devotion and pride, he sighed at the dreary prospect of solitude and ruin. The palace was defiled with smoke and dirt, and the gross intemperance of the Franks. Whole streets had been consumed by fire, or were decayed by the injuries of time. The sacred and profane edifices were stripped of their ornaments, and, as if they were conscious of their approaching exile, the industry of the Latins had been confined to the work of pillage and destruction." Trade had expired under the pressure of anarchy and distress, and the numbers of inhabitants had decreased with the opulence of the city. It was the first care of the Greek monarch to reinstate the nobles in the palaces of their fathers, and the houses or the ground which they occupied were restored to the families that could exhibit a legal right of inheritance. But the far greater part was extinct or lost. The vacant property had devolved to the lord. He repeopled Constantinople by a liberal invitation to the provinces, and the brave volunteers were seated in the capital which had been recovered by their arms. The French barons and the principal families had retired with their emperor, but the patient and humble crowd of Latins was attached to the country, and indifferent to the change of masters. Instead of banishing the factories of the Pisans, Venetians, and Genoese, the prudent conqueror accepted their oaths of allegiance, encouraged their industry, confirmed their privileges, and allowed them to live under the jurisdiction of their proper magistrates. Of these nations, the Pisans and Venetians preserved their respective quarters in the city, but the services and power of the Genoese deserved, at the same time, the gratitude and jealousy of the Greeks. Their independent colony was first planted at the seaport town of Heraclea in Thrace. They were speedily recalled, and settled in the exclusive possession of the suburb of Galata, an advantageous post, in which they revived the commerce and insulted the majesty of the Byzantine Empire. The recovery of Constantinople was celebrated as the era of a new empire. The conqueror alone, and by the right of the sword, renewed his coronation in the church of St. Sophia, and the name and honours of John Lascaris, his pupil and lawful sovereign, were insensibly abolished. But his claim still lived in the minds of the people, and the royal youth must speedily attain the years of manhood and ambition. By fear or conscience, Paleologus was restrained from dipping his hands in innocent and royal blood, but the anxiety of a usurper and a parent urged him to secure his throne by one of those imperfect crimes so familiar to the modern Greeks. The loss of sight incapacitated the young prince for the active business of the world. Instead of the brutal violence of tearing out his eyes, the visual nerve was destroyed by the intense glare of a red-hot basin, and John Lascaris was removed to a distant castle, where he spent many years in privacy and oblivion. Such cool and deliberate guilt may seem incompatible with remorse, but if Michael could trust the mercy of heaven, he was not inaccessible to the reproaches and vengeance of mankind, which he had provoked by cruelty and treason. His cruelty imposed on a servile court the duties of applause or silence, but the clergy had a right to speak in the name of their invisible master, and their holy legions were led by a prelate, whose character was above the temptations of hope or fear. After a short abdication of his dignity, Arsenius had consented to ascend the ecclesiastical throne of Constantinople, and to preside in the restoration of the church. His pious simplicity was long deceived by the arts of Paleologus, 
and his patience and submission might soothe the usurper and protect the safety of the young prince. On the news of his inhuman treatment, the patriarch unsheathed his spiritual sword, and superstition, on this occasion, was enlisted in the cause of humanity and justice. In a synod of bishops, who were stimulated by the example of his zeal, the patriarch pronounced a sentence of excommunication, though his prudence still repeated the name of Michael in the public prayers. The eastern prelates had not adopted the dangerous maxims of ancient Rome, nor did they presume to enforce their censures by deposing princes or absolving nations from their oaths of allegiance. But the Christian, who had been separated from God and the Church, became an object of horror, and in a turbulent and fanatic capital. That horror might arm the hand of an assassin, or inflame a sedition of the people. Paleologus felt his danger, confessed his guilt, and deprecated his judge, the act was irretrievable, the prize was obtained, and the most rigorous penance, which he solicited, would have raised the sinner to the reputation of a saint. The unrelenting patriarch refused to announce any means of atonement or any hopes of mercy, and condescended only to pronounce that for so great a crime, great indeed must be the satisfaction. "'Do you require,' said Michael, "'that I should abdicate the empire?' And at these words he offered, or seemed to offer, the sword of state." Arsenius eagerly grasped this pledge of sovereignty, but when he perceived that the emperor was unwilling to purchase absolution at so dear a rate, he indignantly escaped to his cell, and left the royal sinner kneeling and weeping before the door. End of chapter 62, part 1《Part II of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 62. Greek Emperors of Nice and Constantinople, Part Two. The danger and scandal of this excommunication subsisted above three years, till the popular clamour was assuaged by time and repentance, till the brethren of Arsenius condemned his inflexible spirit, so repugnant to the unbounded forgiveness of the gospel. The emperor had artfully insinuated that if he were still rejected at home, he might seek, in the Roman pontiff, a more indulgent judge, but it was far more easy and effectual to find or to place that judge at the head of the Byzantine church. Arsenius was involved in a vague rumour of conspiracy and disaffection. Some irregular steps in his ordination and government were liable to censure. A synod deposed him from the episcopal office, and he was transported under a guard of soldiers to a small island of the Propontis. Before his exile he sullenly requested that a strict account might be taken of the treasures of the church, boasted that his sole riches, three pieces of gold, had been earned by transcribing the psalms, continued to assert the freedom of his mind, and denied, with his last breath, the pardon which was implored by the royal sinner. After some delay, Gregory, bishop of Adrianople, was translated to the Byzantine throne, but his authority was found insufficient to support the absolution of the emperor, and Joseph, a reverend monk, was substituted to that important function. This edifying scene was represented in the presence of the senate and the people, at the end of six years the humble penitent was restored to the communion of the faithful, and humanity will rejoice that a milder treatment of the captive Lascaris was stipulated as a proof of his remorse. But the spirit of Arsenius still survived in a powerful faction of the monks and clergy, who persevered about forty-eight years in an obstinate schism. Their scruples were treated with tenderness and respect by Michael and his son, and the reconciliation of the Arsenites was the serious labour of the church and state. In the confidence of fanaticism, they had proposed to try their cause by a miracle, and when the two papers that contained their own and the adverse cause were cast into the fiery brazier, they expected that the Catholic verity would be respected by the flames. Alas! the two papers were indiscriminately consumed, and this unforeseen accident produced the union of a day, and renewed the quarrel of an age. The final treaty displayed the victory of the Arsenites, the clergy abstained during forty days from all ecclesiastical functions, a slight penance was imposed on the laity, the body of Arsenus was deposited in the sanctuary, 
and in the name of the departed saint the prince and people were released from the sins of their fathers. The establishment of his family was the motive, or at least the pretense, of the crime of Paleologus, and he was impatient to confirm the succession, by sharing with his eldest son the honours of the purple. Andronicus, afterwards surnamed the Elder, was proclaimed and crowned Emperor of the Romans, in the fifteenth year of his age, and from the first era of a prolix and inglorious reign, he held that august title nine years as the colleague, and fifty as the successor, of his father. Michael, himself, had he died in a private station, would have been thought more worthy of the empire, and the assaults of his temporal and spiritual enemies left him few moments to labour for his own fame, or the happiness of his subjects. He wrestled from the Franks several of the noblest islands of the archipelago, Lesbos, Chios, and Rhodes. His brother, Constantine, was sent to command in Malvasia and Sparta, and the eastern side of the Moria, from Argos and Napoli to Cape Thinners, was repossessed by the Greeks. This effusion of Christian blood was loudly condemned by the patriarch, and the insolent priest presumed to interpose his fears and scruples between the arms of princes. But in the prosecution of these western conquests the countries beyond the Hellespont were left naked to the Turks, and their depredations verified the prophecy of a dying senator, that the recovery of Constantinople would be the ruin of Asia. The victories of Michael were achieved by his lieutenants. His sword rusted in the palace, and in the transactions of the emperor with the popes and kings of Naples, his political acts were stained with cruelty and fraud. The Vatican was the most natural refuge of a Latin emperor, who had been driven from his throne, and Pope Urban the Fourth appeared to pity the misfortunes, and vindicate the cause, of the fugitive Baldwin. A crusade, with plenary indulgence, was preached by his command against the schismatic Greeks. He excommunicated their allies and adherents, solicited Louis the Ninth in favour of his kinsmen, and demanded a tenth of the ecclesiastical revenues of France and England for the service of the Holy War. The subtle Greek, who watched the rising tempest of the West, attempted to suspend or soothe the hostility of the Pope, by suppliant embassies and respectful letters, but he insinuated that the establishment of peace must prepare the reconciliation and obedience of the Eastern Church. The Roman court could not be deceived by so gross an artifice, and Michael was admonished that the repentance of the Son should precede the forgiveness of the Father, and that faith, an ambiguous word, was the only basis of friendship and alliance. After a long and affected delay, the approach of danger, and the importunity of Gregory X, compelled him to enter on a more serious negotiation. He alleged the example of the great Vatices, and the Greek clergy, who understood the intentions of their prince, were not alarmed by the first steps of reconciliation and respect. But when he pressed the conclusion of the treaty, they strenuously declared that the Latins, though not in name, were heretics in fact, and that they despised those strangers as the vilest and most despicable portion of the human race. It was the task of the emperor to persuade, to corrupt, to intimidate the most popular ecclesiastics, to gain the vote of each individual, and alternately to urge the arguments of Christian charity and the public welfare. The texts of the fathers and the arms of the Franks were balanced in the theological and political scale, and without approving the addition to the Nicene Creed, the most moderate were taught to confess, that the two hostile propositions of proceeding from the father by the son, and of proceeding from the father and the son, might be reduced to a safe and Catholic sense. The supremacy of the Pope was a doctrine more easy to conceive, but more painful to acknowledge, Yet Michael represented to his monks and prelates that they might submit to name the Roman bishop as the first of the patriarchs, and that their distance and discretion would guard the liberties of the Eastern Church from the mischievous consequences of the right of appeal. He protested that he would sacrifice his life and empire rather than yield the smallest point of orthodox faith or national independence, and this declaration was sealed and ratified by a golden bull. The patriarch Joseph withdrew to a monastery, to resign or resume his throne, according to the event of the treaty. The letters of union and obedience were subscribed by the emperor, his son Andronicus, and thirty-five archbishops and metropolitans, with their respective synods, and the episcopal list was multiplied by many dioceses, which were annihilated under the yoke of the infidels. An embassy was composed of some trusty ministers and prelates, they embarked for Italy, with rich ornaments and rare perfumes for the altar of St. Peter, and their secret orders authorized and recommended a boundless compliance. 
they were received in the general council of Lyon by Pope Gregory X, at the head of five hundred bishops. He embraced with tears his long-lost and repentant children, accepted the oath of the ambassadors, who abjured the schism in the name of the two emperors, adorned the prelates with ring and mitre, chanted in Greek and Latin the Nicene Creed with the addition of Philoch, and rejoiced in the union of the East and West, which had been reserved for his reign. To consummate this pious work, the Byzantine deputies were speedily followed by the Pope's nuncios, and their instruction discloses the policy of the Vatican, which could not be satisfied with the vain title of supremacy. After viewing the temper of the prince and people, they were enjoined to absolve the schismatic clergy, who should subscribe and wear their abjuration and obedience, to establish in all churches the use of the perfect creed, to prepare the entrance of a cardinal legate, with full powers and dignity of his office, and to instruct the emperor in the advantages which he might derive from the temporal protection of the Roman pontiff. But they found a country without a friend, a nation in which the names of Rome and Union were pronounced with abhorrence. The patriarch Joseph was indeed removed. His place was filled by Vecus, an ecclesiastic of learning and moderation, and the emperor was still urged by the same motives, to persevere in the same professions. But in his private language Paleologus affected to deplore the pride, and to blame the innovations of the Latins, and while he debased his character by this double hypocrisy, he justified and punished the opposition of his subjects. By the joint suffrage of the new and the ancient Rome, a sentence of excommunication was pronounced against the obstinate schismatics. The censures of the church were executed by the sword of Michael. On the failure of persuasion, he tried the arguments of prison and exile, of whipping and mutilation, those touchstones, says an historian, of cowards and the brave." Two Greeks still reigned in Aetolia, Epirus and Thessaly, with the appellation of despots. They had yielded to the sovereign of Constantinople, but they rejected the chains of the Roman pontiff, and supported their refusal by successful arms. Under their protection the fugitive monks and bishops assembled in hostile synods, and retorted the name of heretic with the galling addition of apostate. The prince of Trebizond was tempted to assume the forfeit title of emperor, and even the Latins of Negropont, Thebes, Athens, and the Morea forgot the merits of the convert to join, with open or clandestine aid, the enemies of Paleologus. His favorite generals, of his own blood and family, successively deserted or betrayed the sacrilegious trust. His sister Eulogia, a niece, and two female cousins conspired against him. Another niece, Mary, queen of Bulgaria, negotiated his ruin with the sultan of Egypt, and, in the public eye, their treason was consecrated as the most sublime virtue. To the Pope's nuncios, who urged the consummation of the work, Paleologus exposed a naked recital of all that he had done and suffered for their sake. They were assured that the guilty sectaries, of both sexes and every rank, had been deprived of their honours, their fortunes, and their liberty, a spreading list of confiscation and punishment, which involved many persons, the dearest to the emperor, or the best deserving of his favour. They were conducted to the prison, to behold four princes of the royal blood chained in the four corners, and shaking their fetters in an agony of grief and rage. Two of these captives were afterwards released, the one by submission, the other by death, but the obstinacy of their two companions was chastised by the loss of their eyes, and the Greeks, the least adverse to the Union, deplored that cruel and inauspicious tragedy. Persecutors must expect the hatred of those whom they oppress, but they commonly find some consolation in the testimony of their conscience, the applause of their party, and perhaps the success of their undertaking. But the hypocrisy of Michael, which was prompted only by political motives, must have forced him to hate himself, to despise his followers, and to esteem and envy the rebel champions by whom he was detested and despised. While his violence was abhorred at Constantinople, at Rome his slowness was arraigned, and his sincerity suspected, till at length Pope Martin the Fourth excluded the Greek emperor from the pale of a church, into which he was striving to reduce a schismatic people. No sooner had the tyrant expired than the union was dissolved, and abjured by unanimous consent. The churches were purified, the penitents were reconciled, and his son Andronicus, after weeping the sins and errors of his youth, most piously denied his father the burial of a prince and a Christian. In the distress of the Latins, the walls and towers of Constantinople had fallen to decay. They were restored and fortified by the policy of Michael, 
who deposited a plenteous store of corn and salt provisions, to sustain the siege which he might hourly expect from the resentment of the western powers. Of these, the sovereign of the two Sicilies was the most formidable neighbour, but as long as they were possessed by Manfroy, the bastard of Frederick the Second, his monarchy was the bulwark, rather than the annoyance, of the eastern empire. The usurper, though a brave and active prince, was sufficiently employed in the defence of his throne. His prescription by successive popes had separated Manfroy from the common cause of the Latins, and the forces that might have besieged Constantinople were detained in a crusade against the domestic enemy of Rome. The prize of her adventure, the crown of the two Sicilies, was won and worn by the brother of St. Louis, by Charles, Count of Anjou and Provence, who led the chivalry of France on this holy expedition. The disaffection of his Christian subjects compelled Manfroy to enlist a colony of Saracens whom his father had planted in Apulia, and this odious succour will explain the defiance of the Catholic hero, who rejected all terms of accommodation. Bear this message, said Charles, to the Sultan of Nicora, that God and the sword are umpire between us, and that he shall either send me to paradise, or I will send him to the pit of hell. The armies met, and though I am ignorant of Manfroy's doom in the other world, in this he lost his friends, his kingdom, and his life, in the bloody battle of Benevento. Naples and Sicily were immediately peopled with a warlike race of French nobles, and their aspiring leader embraced the future conquest of Africa, Greece, and Palestine. The most specious reasons might point his first arms against the Byzantine Empire, and Peleologus, diffident of his own strength, repeatedly appealed from the ambition of Charles to the humanity of St. Louis, who still preserved a just ascendant over the mind of his ferocious brother. For a while the attention of that brother was confined at home by the invasion of Conradin, the last heir to the imperial house of Swabia, but the hapless boy sunk in the unequal conflict, and his execution on a public scaffold taught the rivals of Charles to tremble for their heads as well as their dominions. A second respite was obtained by the last crusade of St. Louis to the African coast, and the double motive of interest and duty urged the king of Naples to assist, with his powers and his presence, the holy enterprise. The death of St. Louis released him from the importunity of a virtuous censor. The king of Tunis confessed himself the tributary and vassal of the crown of Sicily, and the boldest of the French knights were free to enlist under his banner against the Greek empire. A treaty and a marriage united his interests with the house of Courtenay. His daughter, Beatrice, was promised to Philip, son and heir of the emperor Baldwin. A pension of six hundred ounces of gold was allowed for his maintenance, and his generous father distributed among his aliens the kingdoms and provinces of the east, reserving only Constantinople, and one day's journey round the city for the imperial domain. In this perilous moment Paleologus was most eager to subscribe the creed, and implore the protection of the Roman pontiff, who assumed, with propriety and weight, the character of an angel of peace, the common father of the Christians. By his voice the sword of Charles was chained in the scabbard, and the Greek ambassadors beheld him, in the Pope's antechamber, biting his ivory sceptre in transport of fury, and deeply resenting the refusal to enfranchise and consecrate his arms. He appears to have respected the disinterested mediation of Gregory X, but Charles was insensibly disgusted by the pride and partiality of Nicholas III, and his attachment to his kindred, the Ursini family, alienated the most strenuous champion from the service of the Church. The hostile league against the Greeks, of Philip the Latin Emperor, the King of the Two Sicilies, and the Republic of Venice, was ripened into execution, and the election of Martin IV, a French pope, gave a sanction to the cause. Of the allies, Philip supplied his name. Martin, a bull of excommunication, the Venetians, a squadron of forty galleys, and the formidable powers of Charles consisted of forty counts, ten thousand men-at-arms, a numerous body of infantry, and a fleet of more than three hundred ships and transports. A distant day was appointed for assembling this mighty force in the harbour of Brindisi, and a previous attempt was risked with a detachment of three hundred knights, who invaded Albania and besieged the fortress of Belgrade. Their defeat might amuse with a triumph the vanity of Constantinople, but the more sagacious Michael, despairing of his arms, depended on the effects of a conspiracy, on the secret workings of a rat, who gnawed the bowstring of the Sicilian tyrant. Among the prescribed adherents of the house of Swabia, John of Procida forfeited a small island of that name in the Bay of Naples. 
His birth was noble, but his education was learned, and in the poverty of exile he was relieved by the practice of physic, which he had studied in the school of Salerno. Fortune had left him nothing to lose except life, and to despise life is the first qualification of a rebel. Procida was endowed with the art of negotiation, to enforce his reasons and disguise his motives, and in his various transactions with nations and men, he could persuade each party that he laboured solely for their interest. The new kingdoms of Charles were afflicted by every species of fiscal and military oppression, and the lives and fortunes of his Italian subjects were sacrificed to the greatness of their master and the licentiousness of his followers. The hatred of Naples was repressed by his presence, but the looser government of his vice-regents excited the contempt, as well as the aversion of the Sicilians. The island was roused to a sense of freedom by the eloquence of Procida, and he displayed to every baron his private interest in the common cause. In the confidence of foreign aid, he successively visited the courts of the Greek emperor, and of Peter, king of Aragon, who possessed the maritime countries of Valentia and Catalonia. To the ambitious Peter a crown was presented, which he might justly claim by his marriage with the sister of Manfroy, and by the dying voice of Conradin, who, from the scaffold, had cast a ring to his heir and avenger. Paleologus was easily persuaded to divert his enemy from a foreign war by a rebellion at home, and a Greek subsidy of twenty-five thousand ounces of gold was most profitably applied to arm a Catalan fleet, which sailed under a holy banner to the specious attack of the Saracens of Africa. In the disguise of a monk or beggar, the indefatigable missionary of revolt flew from Constantinople to Rome, and from Sicily to Saragossa. The treaty was sealed with the signet of Pope Nicholas himself, the enemy of Charles, and his deed of gift transferred the fiefs of St. Peter from the house of Anjou to that of Aragon. So widely diffused and so freely circulated, the secret was preserved above two years with impenetrable discretion, and each of the conspirators imbibed the maxim of Peter, who declared that he would cut off his left hand if it were conscious of the intentions of his right. The mine was prepared with deep and dangerous artifice, but it may be questioned whether the instant explosion of Palermo were the effect of accident or design. On the vigil of Easter a procession of the disarmed citizens visited a church without the walls, and a noble damsel was rudely insulted by a French soldier. The ravisher was instantly punished with death, and if the people was at first scattered by military force, their numbers and fury prevailed. The conspirators seized the opportunity, the flames spread over the island, and eight thousand French were exterminated in a promiscuous massacre, which has obtained the name of the Sicilian Vespers. From every city the banners of freedom and the church were displayed. The revolt was inspired by the presence or the soul of Procida and Peter of Aragon, who sailed from the African coast to Palermo, was saluted as the king and saviour of the isle. By the rebellion of a people on whom he had so long trampled with impunity, Charles was astonished and confounded, and in the first agony of grief and devotion he was heard to exclaim, O oh God, if thou hast decreed to humble me, grant me at least a gentle and gradual descent from the pinnacle of greatness. His fleet and army, which already filled the seaports of Italy, were hastily recalled from the service of the Grecian war, and the situation of Messina exposed that town to the first storm of his revenge. Feeble in themselves, and yet hopeless of foreign succour, the citizens would have repented, and submitted on the assurance of full pardon and their ancient privileges. But the pride of the monarch was already rekindled, and the most fervent entreaties of the legate could extort no more than a promise, that he would forgive the remainder, after a chosen list of eight hundred rebels had been yielded to his discretion. The despair of the Messines renewed their courage. Peter of Aragon approached to their relief, and his rival was driven back by the failure of provision and the terrors of the equinox to the Calabrian shore. At the same moment the Catalan admiral, the famous Roger de Loria, swept the channel with an invincible squadron. The French fleet, more numerous in transports than galleys, was either burnt or destroyed, and the same blow assured the independence of Sicily and the safety of the Greek Empire. A few days before his death, the Emperor Michael rejoiced in the fall of an enemy whom he hated and esteemed, and perhaps he might be content with the popular judgment, that had they not been matched with each other, Constantinople and Italy must speedily have obeyed the same master. From this disastrous moment the life of Charles was a series of misfortunes. His capital was insulted, 
his son was made prisoner, and he sunk into the grave without recovering the Isle of Sicily, which after a war of twenty years was finally severed from the throne of Naples, and transferred as an independent kingdom to a younger branch of the House of Aragon. End of section 12《》Part Three of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Sixty Two: Greek Emperors of Nice and Constantinople, Part Three. I shall not, I trust, be accused of superstition, but I must remark that, even in this world, the natural order of events will sometimes afford the strong appearance of moral retribution. The first Paleologus had saved his empire by involving the kingdoms of the West in rebellion and blood, and from these scenes of discord uprose a generation of iron men, who assaulted and endangered the empire of his son. In modern times our debts and taxes are the secret poison which still corrodes the bosom of peace, but in the weak and disorderly government of the Middle Ages it was agitated by the present evil of the disbanded armies. Too idle to work, too proud to beg, the mercenaries were accustomed to a life of rapine. They could rob with more dignity and effect under a banner and a chief, and the sovereign, to whom their service was useless, and their presence importunate, endeavoured to discharge the torrent on some neighbouring countries. After the peace of Sicily, many thousands of Genoese, Catalans, etc., who had fought, by sea and land, under the standard of Anjou or Aragon, were blended into one nation by the resemblance of their manners and interest. They heard that the Greek provinces of Asia were invaded by the Turks, they resolved to share the harvest of pay and plunder, and Frederick, king of Sicily, most liberally contributed the means of their departure. In a warfare of twenty years, a ship or a camp was become their country. Arms were their sole profession and property. Valor was the only virtue which they knew. Their women had imbibed the fearless temper of their lovers and husbands. It was reported that with a stroke of their broadsword the Catalans could cleave a horseman and a horse, and the report itself was a powerful weapon. Roger de Flor was the most popular of their chiefs, and his personal merit overshadowed the dignity of his prouder rivals of Aragon. The offspring of a marriage between a German gentleman of the court of Frederick the Second and a damsel of Brindisi, Roger was successively a Templar, an apostate, a pirate, and at length the richest and most powerful admiral of the Mediterranean. He sailed from Messina to Constantinople with eighteen galleys, four great ships, and eight thousand adventurers, and his previous treaty was faithfully accomplished by Andronicus the Elder, who accepted with joy and terror this formidable succor. A palace was allotted for his reception, and a niece of the emperor was given in marriage to the valiant stranger, who was immediately created duke or admiral of Romania. After a decent repose he transported his troops over the Propontis, and boldly led them against the Turks. In two bloody battles thirty thousand of the Muslims were slain, he raised the siege of Philadelphia, and deserved the name of Deliverer of Asia. But after a short season of prosperity, the cloud of slavery and ruin again burst on that unhappy province. The inhabitants escaped, says a Greek historian, from the smoke into the flames, and the hostility of the Turks was less pernicious than the friendship of the Catalans. The lives and fortunes which they had rescued they considered as their own. The willing or reluctant maid was saved from the race of circumcision for the embraces of a Christian soldier. The exaction of fines and supplies was enforced by licentious rapine and arbitrary executions, and on the resistance of Magnesia the great duke besieged a city of the Roman Empire. These disorders he excused by the wrongs and passions of a victorious army, nor would his own authority or person have been safe, had he dared to punish his faithful followers, who were defrauded of the just and covenanted price of their services. The threats and complaints of Andronicus disclosed the nakedness of the empire. His golden bull had invited no more than five hundred horse and a thousand foot soldiers, yet the crowds of volunteers, who migrated to the east, had been enlisted and fed by his spontaneous bounty.' 
While his bravest allies were content with three byzants, or pieces of gold, for their monthly pay, an ounce, or even two ounces of gold, were assigned to the Catalans, whose annual pension would thus amount to near a hundred pounds sterling. One of their chiefs had modestly rated at three hundred thousand crowns the value of his future merits, and above a million had been issued from the treasury for the maintenance of these costly mercenaries. A cruel tax had been imposed on the corn of the husbandman. One-third was retrenched from the salaries of the public officers, and the standard of the coin was so shamefully debased that of the four-and-twenty parts only five were of pure gold. At the summons of the emperor, Roger evacuated a province which no longer supplied the materials of rapine, but he refused to disperse his troops, and while his style was respectful, his conduct was independent and hostile. He protested that if the emperor should march against him, he would advance forty paces to kiss the ground before him, but in rising from this prostrate attitude Roger had a life and sword at the service of his friends. The great Duke of Romania condescended to accept the title and ornaments of Caesar, but he rejected the new proposal of the government of Asia with the subsidy of corn and money, on condition that he should reduce his troops to the harmless number of three thousand men. Assassination is the last resource of cowards. The Caesar was tempted to visit the royal residence of Adrianople, in the apartment and before the guards of the empress he was stabbed by the alani guards and though the deed was imputed to their private revenge his countrymen who dwelt at constantinople in the security of peace were involved in the same prescription by the prince or people the loss of their leader intimidated the crowd of adventurers who hoisted the sails of flight and were soon scattered round the coasts of the mediterranean but a veteran band of fifteen hundred Catalans, or French, stood firm in the strong fortress of Gallipoli on the Hellespont, displayed the banners of Aragon, and offered to revenge and justify their chief, by an equal combat of ten or a hundred warriors. Instead of accepting this bold defiance, the Emperor Michael, the son and colleague of Andronicus, resolved to oppress them with the weight of multitudes. Every nerve was strained to form an army of thirteen thousand horse and thirty thousand foot, and the Propontis was covered with the ships of the Greeks and Genoese. In two battles, by sea and land, these mighty forces were encountered and overthrown by the despair and discipline of the Catalans. The young emperor fled to the palace, and an insufficient guard of light horse was left for the protection of the open country. Victory renewed the hopes and numbers of the adventurers. Every nation was blended under the name and standard of the great company, and three thousand Turkish proselytes deserted from the imperial service to join this military association. In the possession of Gallipoli, the Catalans intercepted the trade of Constantinople and the Black Sea, while they spread their devastation on either side of the Hellespont over the confines of Europe and Asia. To prevent their approach, the greatest part of the Byzantine territory was laid waste by the Greeks themselves, the peasants and their cattle retired into the city, and myriads of sheep and oxen, for which neither place nor food could be procured, were unprofitably slaughtered on the same day. Four times the emperor Andronicus sued for peace, and four times he was inflexibly repulsed, till the want of provisions and the discord of the chiefs compelled the Catalans to evacuate the banks of the Hellespont and the neighborhood of the capital. After their separation from the Turks, the remains of the great company pursued their march through Macedonia and Thessaly to seek a new establishment in the heart of Greece. After some ages of oblivion, Greece was awakened to new misfortune by the arms of the Latins. In the two hundred and fifty years between the first and the last conquest of Constantinople, that venerable land was disputed by a multitude of petty tyrants. Without the comforts of freedom and genius, her ancient cities were again plunged in foreign and intestine war, and if servitude be preferable to anarchy, they might repose with joy under the Turkish yoke. I shall not pursue the obscure and various dynasties that rose and fell on the continent or in the isles, but our silence on the fate of Athens would argue a strange ingratitude to the first and purest school of liberal science and amusement. In the partition of the empire, the principality of Athens and Thebes was assigned to Otto de la Roche, a noble warrior of Burgundy, with the title of great duke, which the Latins understand in their own sense, and the Greeks more foolishly derive from the age of Constantine. Otto followed the standard of the Marquis of Montferrat, the ample state which he acquired by miracle of conduct or fortune was peaceably inherited by his son and two grandsons, till the family, though not the nation, was changed by the marriage of an heiress into the elder branch of the house of Brienne. 
The son of that marriage, Walter de Brienne, succeeded to the Duchy of Athens, and with the aid of some Catalan mercenaries, whom he invested with fiefs, reduced above thirty castles of the vassal or neighboring lords. But when he was informed of the approach and ambition of the great company, he collected a force of seven hundred knights, six thousand four hundred horse, and eight thousand foot, and boldly met them on the banks of the river Sisyphus in Boeotia. The Catalans amounted to no more than three thousand five hundred horse and four thousand foot, but the deficiency of numbers was compensated by stratagem and order. They formed round their camp an artificial inundation. The duke and his knights advanced without fear or precaution on the verdant meadow. Their horses plunged into the bog, and he was cut in pieces with the greatest part of the French cavalry. His family and nation were expelled, and his son, Walter de Brenne, the titular Duke of Athens, the tyrant of Florence, and the constable of France, lost his life in the field of Poitiers. Attica and Boeotia were the rewards of the victorious Catalans. They married the widows and daughters of the slain, and during fourteen years the great company was the terror of the Grecian states. Their factions drove them to acknowledge the sovereignty of the House of Aragon, and during the remainder of the fourteenth century, Athens, as a government or an appendage, was successively bestowed by the kings of Sicily. After the French and Catalans, the third dynasty was that of the Accioli, a family plebeian at Florence, potent at Naples, and sovereign in Greece. Athens, which they embellished with new buildings, became the capital of a state that extended over Thebes, Argos, Corinth, Delphi, and a part of Thessaly, and their reign was finally determined by Mohammed the Second, who strangled the last duke and educated his sons in the discipline and religion of the Seraglio. Athens, though no more than the shadow of her former self, still contains about eight or ten thousand inhabitants. Of these, three fourths are Greek in religion and language and the Turks, who compose the remainder, have relaxed, in their intercourse with the citizens, somewhat of the pride and gravity of their national character. The olive-tree, the gift of Minerva, flourishes in Attica, nor has the honey of Mount Hymettus lost any part of its exquisite flavor. But the languid trade is monopolized by strangers, and the agriculture of a barren land is abandoned to the vagrant Wallachians. The Athenians are still distinguished by the subtlety and acuteness of their understandings, but these qualities, unless ennobled by freedom and enlightened by study, will degenerate into a low and selfish cunning, and it is a proverbial saying of the country, from the Jews of Thessalonica, the Turks of Negropont, and the Greeks of Athens, good Lord deliver us. This artful people has eluded the tyranny of the Turkish bashaws, by an expedient which alleviates their servitude and aggravates their shame. About the middle of the last century, the Athenians chose for their protector Kisar Aga, or chief black eunuch of the Seraglio. This Ethiopian slave, who possesses the sultan's ear, condescends to accept the tribute of thirty thousand crowns. His lieutenant, the Waywode, whom he annually confirms, may reserve for his own about five or six thousand more, and such is the policy of the citizens that they seldom fail to remove and punish an oppressive governor. Their private differences are decided by the archbishop, one of the richest prelates of the Greek church, since he possesses a revenue of one thousand pounds sterling, and by a tribunal of the eight geranti, or elders, chosen in the eight quarters of the city, the noble families cannot trace their pedigree above three hundred years, but their principal members are distinguished by a grave demeanour, a fur cap, and the lofty appellation of archon. By some who delight in the contrast, the modern language of Athens is represented as the most corrupt and barbarous of the seventy dialects of the vulgar Greek. This picture is too darkly coloured, but it would not be easy, in the country of Plato and Demosthenes, to find a reader or a copy of their works." The Athenians walk with supine indifference among the glorious ruins of antiquity, and such is the debasement of their character that they are incapable of admiring the genius of their predecessors. End of section 13「Of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire」Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 6, Chapter 62, Part 1.
civil wars, and the ruin of the Greek Empire. The long reign of Andronicus the Elder is chiefly memorable by the disputes of the Greek Church, the invasion of the Catalans, and the rise of the Ottoman power. He is celebrated as the most learned and virtuous prince of the age, but such virtue and such learning contributed neither to the perfection of the individual, nor to the happiness of society. A slave of the most abject superstition, he was surrounded on all sides by visible and invisible enemies. Nor were the flames of hell less dreadful to his fancy than those of a Catalan or Turkish war. Under the reign of the Paleology, the choice of the patriarch was the most important business of the state. The heads of the Greek church were ambitious and fanatic monks, and their vices or virtues, their learning or ignorance, were equally mischievous or contemptible. By his intemperate discipline, the patriarch Athanasius excited the hatred of the clergy and people. He was heard to declare that the sinner should swallow the last dregs of the cup of penance, and the foolish tale was propagated by his punishing a sacrilegious ass that had tasted the lettuce of a convent garden. Driven from the throne by the universal clamour, Athanasius composed before his retreat two papers of a very opposite caste. His public testament was in the tone of charity and resignation. The private codicil breathed the direst anathemas against the authors of his disgrace, whom he excluded forever from the communion of the Holy Trinity, the angels, and the saints. This last paper he enclosed in an earthen pot, which was placed, by his order, on the top of one of the pillars, in the dome of St. Sophia, in the distant hope of discovery and revenge. At the end of four years, some youths, climbing by a ladder in search of pigeons' nests, detected the fatal secret. And, as Andronicus felt himself touched and bound by the excommunication, he trembled on the brink of the abyss, which had been so treacherously dug under his feet. A synod of bishops was instantly convened to debate this important question. The rashness of these clandestine anathemas was generally condemned. But as the knot could be untied only by the same hand, as that hand was now deprived of the crossier, it appeared that this posthumous decree was irrevocable by any earthly power. Some faint testimonies of repentance and pardon were exhorted from the author of the mischief, but the conscience of the emperor was still wounded, and he desired, with no less ardour than Athanasius himself, the restoration of a patriarch, by whom alone he could be healed. At the dead of night, a monk rudely knocked at the door of the royal bedchamber, announcing a revelation of plague and famine, of inundations and earthquakes. Andronicus started from his bed, and spent the night in prayer, till he felt, or thought that he felt, a slight motion of the earth. The emperor on foot led the bishops and monks to the cell of Athanasius, and, after a proper resistance, the saint, from whom this message had been sent, consented to absolve the prince, and govern the church of Constantinople. Untamed by disgrace, and hardened by solitude, the shepherd was again odious to the flock, and his enemies contrived a singular, and, as it proved, a successful mode of revenge. In the night, they stole away the footstool or footcloth of his throne, which they secretly replaced with the decoration of a satirical picture. The emperor was painted with a bridle in his mouth, and Athanasius leading the tractable beast to the feet of Christ. The authors of the libel were detected and punished, but, as their lives had been spared, the Christian priest, in sullen indignation, retired to his cell and the eyes of Andronicus, which had been opened for a moment, were again closed by his successor. If this transaction be one of the most curious and important of a reign of fifty years, I cannot at least accuse the brevity of my materials. Since I reduce into some few pages the enormous folios of Pycomar, Cantacuzen, and Nicephorus Gregorus, who have composed the prolix and languid story of the times, the name and situation of the emperor, 
John Cantacuzene, might inspire the most lively curiosity. His memorials of forty years extend from the revolt of the younger Andronicus to his own abdication of the empire. And it is observed that, like Moses and Caesar, he was the principal actor in the scenes which he describes. But in this eloquent work we should vainly seek the sincerity of a hero or a penitent. Retired in a cloister from the vices and passions of the world, he presents, not in a confession but an apology, of the life of an ambitious statesman. Instead of unfolding the true counsels and characters of men, he displays the smooth and spacious surface of events, highly varnished with his own praises and those of his friends. Their motives are always pure, their ends always legitimate, they conspire and rebel without any views of interest, and the violence which they inflict or suffer is celebrated as a spontaneous effect of reason and virtue. After the example of the first paleology, the elder Andronicus associated his son Michael to the honours of the purple, and from the age of eighteen to his premature death, the prince was acknowledged, above twenty-five years, as the second emperor of the Greeks. At the head of an army, he excited neither the fears of the enemy, nor the jealousy of the court. His modesty and patience were never tempted to compute the years of his father, nor was that father compelled to repent of his liberality, either by the virtues or vices of his son. The son of Michael was named Andronicus from his grandfather, to whose early favour he was introduced by that nominal resemblance. The blossoms of wit and beauty increased the fondness of the elder Andronicus, and, with the common vanity of age, he expected to realise in the second the hope which had been disappointed in the first generation. The boy was educated in the palace as an heir and a favourite, and in the oaths and acclamations of the people, the august triad was formed by the names of the father, the son, and the grandson. But the younger Andronicus was speedily corrupted by his infant greatness, while he beheld with puerile impatience the double obstacle that hung, and might long hang, over his rising ambition. It was not to acquire fame, or to diffuse happiness, that he so eagerly aspired. Wealth and impunity were in his eyes the most precious attributes of a monarch, and his first indiscreet demand was the sovereignty of some rich and fertile island, where he might lead a life of independence and pleasure. The emperor was offended by the loud and frequent intemperance which disturbed his capital. The sums which his parsimony denied were supplied by the Genoese usherers of Pera, and their oppressive debt, which consolidated the interest of a faction, could be discharged only by a revolution. A beautiful female, a matron in rank, a prostitute in manners, had instructed the younger Andronicus in the rudiments of love. But he had reason to suspect the nocturnal visits of a rival, and a stranger passing through the street was pierced by the arrows of his guard, who were placed in ambush at her door. That stranger was his brother, Prince Manuel, who languished and died of his wound and the Emperor Michael, their common father, whose health was in a declining state, expired on the eighth day, lamenting the loss of both his children. However guiltless in his intention, the younger Andronicus might impute a brother's and a father's death to the consequence of his own vices. And deep was the sigh of thinking and feeling men, when they perceived, instead of sorrow and repentance, his ill-dissembled joy on the removal of two odious competitors. By these melancholy events, and the increase of his disorders, the mind of the elder emperor was gradually alienated, and, after many fruitless reproofs, he transferred on another grandson his hopes and affection. The change was announced by the new oath of allegiance to the reigning sovereign, and the person whom he should appoint for his successor and the acknowledged heir, after a repetition of insults and complaints, was exposed to the indignity of a public trial. 
before the sentence, which would probably have condemned him to a dungeon or a cell, the emperor was informed that the palace courts were filled with the armed followers of his grandson. The judgment was softened to a treaty of reconciliation, and the triumphant escape of the prince encouraged the ardour of the younger faction. Yet the capital, the clergy, and the senate, adhered to the person, or at least to the government, of the old emperor, and it was only in the provinces, by flight and revolt, and foreign succour, that the malcontents could hope to vindicate their cause and subvert his throne. The soul of the enterprise was the great domestic, John Cantacuzene. The sally from Constantinople is the first date of his actions and memorials, and if his own pen be most descriptive of his patriotism, an unfriendly historian has not refused to celebrate the zeal and ability which he displayed in the service of the young emperor. That prince escaped from the capital under the pretense of hunting, erected his standard at Adrianople, and in a few days assembled fifty thousand horse and foot, whom neither honour nor duty could have armed against the barbarians. Such a force might have saved or commanded the empire. But their counsels were discordant, their motions were slow and doubtful, and their progress was checked by intrigue and negotiation. The quarrel of the two Andronici was protracted and suspended and renewed during a ruinous period of seven years. In the first treaty, the relics of the Greek Empire were divided. Constantinople, Thessalonica, and the islands were left to the elder, while the younger acquired the sovereignty of the greatest parts of Thrace. From Philippi to the Byzantine limit, by the second treaty he stipulated the payment of his troops, his immediate coronation, and an adequate share of the power and revenue of the state. The third civil war was terminated by the surprise of Constantinople, the final retreat of the old emperor, and the sole reign of his victorious grandson. The reasons of this delay may be found in the characters of the men and of the times. When the heir of the monarchy first pleaded his wrongs and his apprehensions, he was heard with pity and applause, and his ardence repeated on all sides the inconsistent promise that he would increase the pay of the soldiers and alleviate the burdens of the people. The grievances of forty years were mingled in his revolt, and the rising generation were fatigued by the endless prospect of a reign whose favourites and maxims were of other times. The youth of Andronicus had been without spirit, his age was without reverence. His taxes produced an unusual revenue of five hundred thousand pounds. Yet the riches of the sovereigns of Christendom was incapable of maintaining three thousand horse and twenty galleys to resist the destructive progress of the Turks. How different, said the younger Andronicus, is my situation from that of the son of Philip, Alexander might complain that his father would leave him nothing to conquer. Alas, my grandsire would leave me nothing to lose. But the Greeks were soon admonished that the public disorders could not be healed by a civil war, and that their young favourite was not destined to be the saviour of a falling empire. On the first repulse, his party was broken by his own levity, their intense discord, and the intrigues of the ancient court, which tempted each malcontent to desert or betray the cause of the rebellion. Andronicus the younger was touched with remorse, or fatigued with business, or deceived by negotiation. Pleasure rather than power was his aim, and the license of maintaining a thousand hounds, a thousand hawks, and a thousand huntsmen was sufficient to sully his fame and disarm his ambition. Let us now survey the catastrophe of this busy plot, and the final situation of the principal actors. The age of Andronicus was consumed in civil discord, and, amidst the events of war and treaty, his power and reputation continually decayed, till the fatal night in which the gates of the city and palace were opened without resistance to his grandson. His principal commander scorned the repeated warnings of danger,
and retiring to rest in the vain security of ignorance, abandoned the feeble monarch, with some priests and pages, to the terror of a sleepless night. These terrors were quickly realized by the hostile shouts, which proclaimed the titles and victory of Andronicus the Younger, and the aged emperor, falling prostrate before an image of the Virgin, dispatched a suppliant message to resign the sceptre, and to obtain his life at the hands of the conqueror. The answer of his grandson was decent and pious. At the prayer of his friends, the younger Andronicus assumed the sole administration, but the elder still enjoyed the name and preeminence of the first emperor, the use of the great palace, and a pension of twenty-four thousand pieces of gold, one half of which was assigned on the royal treasury, and the other on the fishery of Constantinople. But his impotence was soon exposed to contempt and oblivion. The vast silence of the palace was disturbed only by the cattle and poultry of the neighbourhood, which roved with impunity through the solitary courts, and a reduced allowance of ten thousand pieces of gold was all that he could ask, and more than he could hope. His calamities were embittered by the gradual extinction of his sight. His confinement was rendered each day more rigorous, and, during the absence and sickness of his grandson, his inhuman keepers, by the threats of instant death, compelled him to exchange the purple for the monastic habit and profession. The monk Antony had renounced the pomp of the world, yet he had occasion for a coarse fur in the winter season, and as wine was forbidden by his confessor, and water by his physician, the sherbet of Egypt was his common drink. It was not without difficulty that the late emperor could procure three or four pieces to satisfy these simple wants, and if he bestowed the gold to relieve the more painful distress of a friend, the sacrifices of some weight in the scale of humanity and religion. Four years after his abdication, Andronicus, or Antony, expired in a cell, in the seventy-fourth year of his age, and the last strain of adulation could only promise a more splendid crown of glory in heaven than he had enjoyed upon earth. Nor was the reign of the younger more glorious or fortunate than that of the elder Andronicus. He gathered the fruits of ambition, but the taste was transient and bitter. In the supreme station he lost the remains of his early popularity, and the defects of his character became still more conspicuous to the world. The public reproach urged him to march in person against the Turks. Nor did his courage fail in the hour of trial. But a defeat and a wound were the only trophies of his expedition in Asia, which confirmed the establishment of the Ottoman monarchy. The abuses of the civil government attained their full maturity and perfection. His neglect of forms and the confusion of national dress are deplored by the Greeks as the fatal symptoms of the decay of the empire. Andronicus was old before his time. The intemperance of youth had accelerated the infirmities of age. And, after being rescued from a dangerous malady, by nature or physic or the virgin, he was snatched away before he had accomplished his forty-fifth year. He was twice married, and, as the progress of the Latins in arms and arts has softened the prejudices of the Byzantine court, his two wives were chosen in the princely houses of Germany and Italy. The first, Agnes at home, Irene in Greece, was daughter of the Duke of Brunswick. Her father was a petty lord, in the poor and savage regions of the north of Germany, yet he derived some revenue from his silver mines. And his family is celebrated by the Greeks as the most ancient and noble of the Teutonic name. After the death of this childish princess, Andronicus sought in marriage Jane, the sister of the Count of Savoy, and his suit was preferred to that of the French king. The Count respected in his sister the superior majesty of a Roman empress. Her retinue was composed of knights and ladies. She was regenerated and crowned in St. Sophia, under the more orthodox appellation of Anne and at the nuptial fest, 
the Greeks and Italians vied with each other in the martial excesses of tilts and tournaments. The Empress, Anne of Savoy, survived her husband. Their son, John Palaeologus, was left an orphan, and an emperor in the ninth year of his age, and his weakness was protected by the first and most deserving of the Greeks. The long and cordial friendship of his father, for John Cantacuzene, is alike honourable to the prince and the subject. It had been formed amidst the pleasures of their youth, their families were most equally noble, and the recent lustre of the purple was amply compensated by the energy of a private education. We have seen that the young emperor was saved by Cantacuzene from the power of his grandfather, and, after six years of civil war, the same favourite brought him back in triumph to the palace of Constantinople. Under the reign of Andronicus the Younger, the great domestic ruled the emperor and the empire, and it was by his valour and conduct that the Isle of Lesbos and the Principality of Atolia were restored to their ancient allegiance. His enemies confess that, among the public robbers, Cantacuzene alone was moderate and abstemious, and the free and voluntary account which he produces of his own wealth may sustain the presumption that he was devolved by inheritance and not accumulated by rapine. He does not indeed specify the value of his money, plate, and jewels, yet, after a voluntary gift of two hundred vases of silver, after much had been secreted by his friends and plundered by his foes, his forfeit treasures were sufficient for the equipment of a fleet of seventy galleys. He does not measure the size and number of his estates, but his granaries were heaped with an incredible store of wheat and barley, and the labour of a thousand yoke of oxen might cultivate, according to the practice of antiquity, about sixty-two thousand five hundred acres of arable land. His pastures were stocked with two thousand five hundred brood mares, two hundred camels, three hundred mules, five hundred asses, five thousand horned cattle, fifty thousand hogs, and seventy thousand sheep. A precious record of rural opulence in the last period of the empire, and in a land, most probably in Thrace, so repeatedly wasted by foreign and domestic hostility. The favour of Cantacuzene was above his fortune. In the moments of familiarity, in the hour of sickness, the emperor was desirous to level the distance between them, and pressed his friend to accept the diadem and purple. The virtue of the great domestic, which is attested by his own pen, resisted the dangerous proposal. But the last testament of Andronicus the Younger, named him guardian of his son, and the regent of the empire. Had the regent found a suitable return of obedience and gratitude, perhaps he would have acted with pure and zealous fidelity in the service of his pupil. A guard of five hundred soldiers watched over his person and the palace. The funeral of the late emperor was decently performed, the capital was silent and submissive, and five hundred letters— which Cantacuzene dispatched in the first month, informed the provinces of their loss and their duty. The prospect of a tranquil minority was blasted by the great duke or admiral Apocacus, and, to exaggerate his perfidy, the imperial historian is pleased to magnify his own imprudence, in raising him to that office against the advice of his more sagacious sovereign. Bold and subtle, rapacious and profuse, the avarice and ambition of Apocaeacus were by turns subservient to each other, and his talents were applied to the ruin of his country. His arrogance was heightened by the command of a naval force and an impregnable castle, and, under the mask of oaths and flattery, he secretly conspired against his benefactor. The female court of the empress was bribed and directed, he encouraged Anna Savoy to assist, by the law of nature, the tutelage of her son. The love of power was disguised by the anxiety of maternal tenderness. And the founder of the Paleologi 
had instructed his posterity to dread the example of a perfidious guardian. The patriarch, John of Apri, was a proud and feeble old man, encompassed by a numerous and hungry kindred. He produced an obsolete epistle of Andronicus, which bequeathed the prince and people to his pious care. The fate of his predecessor, Arsenius, prompted him to prevent, rather than punish, the crimes of a usurper. And Apocaeacus smiled at the success of his own flattery, when he beheld the Byzantine priest assuming the state and temporal claims of the Roman pontiff. Between three persons so different in their situation and character, a private league was concluded, a shadow of authority was restored to the senate, and the people were tempted by the name of freedom. By this powerful confederacy, the great domestic was assaulted at first with clandestine, at length with open arms. His prerogatives were disputed, his opinions slighted, his friends persecuted, and his safety was threatened both in the camp and city. In his absence on the public service, he was accused of treason, prescribed as an enemy of the church and state, and delivered with all his adherence to the sword of justice the vengeance of the people, and the power of the devil. His fortunes were confiscated, his aged mother was cast into prison, all his past services were buried in oblivion, and he was driven by injustice to perpetrate the crime of which he was accused. From the review of his preceding conduct, Cantacuzen appears to have been guiltless of any treasonable designs, and the only superstition of his innocence must arise from the vehemence of his protestations, and sublime purity which he ascribes to his own virtue. While the empress and the patriarch still affected the appearance of harmony, he repeatedly solicited the permission of retiring to a private, and even a monastic life. After he had been declared a public enemy, it was his fervent wish to throw himself at the feet of the young emperor, and to receive without a murmur the stroke of the executioner. It was not without reluctance that he listened to the voice of reason, which inculcated the sacred duty of saving his family and friends, and proved that he could only save them by drawing the sword and assuming the imperial title. End of chapter 62, part 1part two of the history of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lizzie driver the history of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume six chapter sixty three civil wars and the ruin of the greek empire part two in the strong city of Demotica, his peculiar domain, the emperor John Cantacuzenus was invested with the purple buskins. His right leg was clothed by his noble kinsmen, the left by the Latin chiefs, on whom he conferred the order of knighthood. But even in this act of revolt, he was still studious of loyalty. And the titles of John Paleologus and Anna Savoy were proclaimed before his own name and that of his wife Irene. Such vain ceremony is a thin disguise of rebellion, nor are there perhaps any personal wrongs that can authorise a subject to take arms against his sovereign. But the want of a preparation and success may confirm the assurance of the usurper that this decisive step was the effect of necessity rather than of choice. Constantinople adhered to the young emperor, the king of Bulgaria was invited to the relief of Adrianople, the principal cities of Thrace and Macedonia, after some hesitation, renounced their obedience to the great domestic, and the leaders of the troops and provinces were induced, by their private interest, to prefer the loose dominion of a woman and a priest. The army of Cantacuzene, in sixteen divisions, was stationed on the bank of the Melis, to tempt or to intimidate the capital. It was dispersed by treachery or fear, and the officers, more especially the mercenary Latins, 
accepted the bribes and embraced the service of the Byzantine court. After this loss, the rebel emperor, he fluctuated between the two characters, took the road to Thessalonica with a chosen remnant. But he failed in his enterprise on that important place, and he was closely pursued by the great duke, his enemy Apocaeacus, at the head of a superior power by sea and land. Driven from the coach, in his march, or rather flight, into the mountains of Servia, Cantacuzene assembled his troops to scrutinize those who were worthy and willing to accompany his broken fortunes. A base majority bowed and retired. And his trusty band was diminished to two thousand, and at last to five hundred volunteers. The kraal, or despot of the Servians, received him with general hospitality, but the ally was insensibly degraded to a suppliant, a hostage, a captive, and, in this miserable dependence, he waited at the door of the barbarian, who could dispose of the life and liberty of a Roman emperor. The most tempting offers could not persuade the kraal to violate his trust, but he soon inclined to the stronger side, and his friend was dismissed without injury to a new vicissitude of hopes and perils. Near six years the flame of discord burnt with various success and unabated rage. The cities were distracted by the faction of the nobles and the plebeians, the Cantacuzeni and Palaeology, and the Bulgarians, the Servians, and the Turks were invoked on both sides as the instruments of private ambition and the common ruin. The regent deplored the calamities, of which he was the author and victim, and his only experience might dictate a just and lively remark on the different nature of foreign and civil war. The former, said he, is the external warmth of summer, always tolerable and often beneficial. The latter is the deadly heat of a fever, which consumes without a remedy the vitals of the constitution. The introduction of barbarians and savages into the contests of civil nations is a measure pregnant with shame and mischief, which the interest of the moment may compel, but which is reprobated by the best principles of humanity and reason. It is the practice of both sides to accuse their enemies of the guilt of the first alliances, and those who fail in their negotiations are loudest in their censure of the example which they envy and would gladly imitate. The Turks of Asia were less barbarous, perhaps, than the shepherds of Bulgaria and Servia, but their religion rendered them implicable foes of Rome and Christianity. To acquire the friendship of their emirs, the two factions vied with each other in baseness of profusion. The dexterity of Cantacuzene obtained the preference, but the succour and victory were dearly purchased by the marriage of his daughter with an infidel, the captivity of many thousand Christians, and the passage of the Ottomans into Europe the last and fatal stroke in the fall of the Roman Empire. The inclining scale was decided in his favour by the death of Apocaeacus, the just though singular retribution of his crimes. A crowd of nobles or plebeians, whom he feared or hated, had been seized by his orders in the capital and the provinces, and the old palace of Constantine was assigned as the place of their confinement. Some alterations in raising the walls and narrowing the cells had been ingeniously contrived to prevent their escape, and aggravate their misery, and the work was incessantly pressed by the daily visits of the tyrant. His guards watched at the gate, and as he stood in the inner court to overlook the architects, without fear or suspicion, he was assaulted and laid breathless on the ground by two resolute prisoners of the Paleologian race who were armed with sticks and animated by despair. On the rumour of revenge and liberty, the captive multitude broke their fetters, fortified their prison, and exposed from the battlements the tyrant's head, presuming on the favour of the people and the clemency of the empress. Anne of Savoy might rejoice in the fall of a haughty and ambitious minister, but while she delayed to resolve or to act, the populace, more especially the mariners, were excited by the widow of the great duke to a sedition, an assault, and a massacre. 
the prisoners, of whom the far greater part were guiltless or inglorious of the deed, escaped to a neighbouring church. They were slaughtered at the foot of the altar, and in his death the monster was no less bloody and venomous than in his life. Yet his talents alone upheld the cause of the young emperor, and his surviving associates, suspicious of each other, abandoned the conduct of war, and rejected the fairest terms of accommodation. In the beginning of the dispute, the empress felt, and complained, that she was deceived by the enemies of Cantacuzene. The patriarch was employed to preach against the forgiveness of injuries, and her promise of immortal hatred was sealed by an oath under the penalty of excommunication. But Anne soon learned to hate without a teacher. She beheld the misfortunes of the empire with the indifference of a stranger. Her jealousy was exasperated by the competition of a rival empress, and, on the first symptoms of a more yielding temper, she threatened the patriarch to convene a synod, and degrade him from his office. Their incapacity and discord would have afforded the most decisive advantage, but the civil war was protracted by the weakness of both parties, and the moderation of Cantacuzene had not escaped the reproach of timidity and indolence. He successfully recovered the provinces and cities, and the realm of his people was measured by the walls of Constantinople. But the metropolis alone counterbalanced the rest of the empire. Nor could he attempt that important conquest till he had secured in his favour the public voice and a private correspondence. An Italian, of the name Faciolati, had succeeded to the office of great duke. The ships, the guards, and the golden gate were subject to his command. But his humble ambition was bribed to become the instrument of treachery, and the revolution was accomplished without danger or bloodshed. Destitute of the powers of resistance, or the hope of relief, the inflexible Anne would still have defended the palace, and have smiled to behold the capital in flames, rather than in the possession of a rival. She yielded to the prayers of her friends and enemies, and the treaty was dictated by the conqueror, who professed a loyal and zealous attachment to the son of his benefactor. The marriage of his daughter, with John Paleologus, was at length consummated. The hereditary right of the pupil was acknowledged, but the sole administration during ten years was vested in the guardian. Two emperors and three empresses were seated on the Byzantine throne, and a general amnesty quieted the apprehensions, and confirmed the property of the most guilty subjects. The festival of the coronation and nuptials was celebrated with the appearance of concord and magnificence, and both were equally fallacious. During the late troubles, the treasures of the state, and even the furniture of the palace, had been alienated or embezzled. The royal banquet was served in pewter or earthenware, and such was the poverty of the times, that the absence of gold and jewels was supplied by the paltry artifices of glass and gilt leather. I hasten to conclude the personal history of John Cantacuzene. He triumphed and reigned, but his reign and triumph were clouded by the discontent of his own and the adverse faction. His followers might style the general amnesty an act of pardon for his enemies, and of oblivion for his friends. In his cause their estates had been forfeited or plundered, and as they wandered naked and hungry through the streets, they cursed the selfish generosity of a leader, who, on the throne of the empire, might relinquish without merit his private inheritance. The adherents of the empress blushed to hold their lives and fortunes, by the precariousness favour of a usurper, and the thirst of revenge was concealed by a tender concern for the succession, and even the safety, of her son. They were justly alarmed by a petition of the friends of Cantacuzene, that they might be released from their oath of allegiance to the Paleologi, and entrusted with the defence of some cautionary towns, a measure supported with argument and eloquence, and which was rejected, says the imperial historian, by most sublime and almost incredible virtue. 
his response was disturbed by the sounds of plots and sedations, and he trembled lest the lawful prince should be stolen away by some foreign or domestic enemy, who would inscribe his name and his wrongs in the banners of rebellion. As the son of Andronicus advanced in the years of manhood, he began to feel and to act for himself, and his rising ambition was rather stimulated than checked by the imitation of his father's vices. If we may trust his own professions, Cantacuzene laboured with honest industry to correct these sordid and sensual appetites, and to raise the mind of the young prince to a level with his fortune. In the Servian expedition, the two emperors showed themselves in cordial harmony to the troops and provinces, and the younger colleague was initiated by the elder in the mysteries of war and government. After the conclusion of the peace, Palaeologus was left in Thessalonica, a royal residence and a frontier station, to secure by his absence the peace of Constantinople, and to withdraw his youth from the temptations of a luxurious capital. But the distance weakened the powers of control, and the son of Andronicus was surrounded with artful or unthinking companions, who taught him to hate his guardian, to deplore his exile, and to vindicate his rights. A private treaty with the kraal or despot of Servia was soon followed by an open revolt, and Cantacuzene, on the throne of the elder Andronicus, defended the cause of age and prerogative, which in his youth he had so vigorously attacked. At his request, the empress mother undertook the voyage of Thessalonica, and the office of mediation. She returned without success, and, unless Anna Savoy was instructed by adversity, we may doubt the sincerity, or at least the fervour, of her zeal. While the regent grasped the sceptre with a firm and vigorous hand, she had been instructed to declare that the ten years of his legal administration would soon elapse, and that, after a full trial of the vanity of the world, the emperor Cantacuzene sighed for the repose of a cloister, and was ambitious only of a heavenly crown. Had these sentiments been genuine, his voluntary abdication would have restored the peace of the empire, and his consciousness would have been relieved by an act of justice. Palaeologus alone was responsible for his future government, and, whatever might be his vices, they were surely less formidable than the calamities of a civil war, in which the barbarians and infidels were again invited to assist the Greeks in their mutual destruction. By the arms of the Turks, who now struck a deep and everlasting root in Europe, Cantacuzene prevailed in the third contest in which he would have been involved, and the young emperor, driven from the sea and land, was compelled to take shelter among the Latins of the Isle of Tenedos. His insolence and obstinacy provoked the victor to a step which must render the quarrel irreconcilable, and the association of his son Matthew, whom he invested with the purple, established the succession in the family of the Cantacuzeni. But Constantinople was still attached to the blood of her ancient princes, and this last injury accelerated the restoration of the rightful heir. A noble Genosi espoused the cause of Palaeologus, obtained a promise of his sister, and achieved the revolution with two galleys and two thousand five hundred auxiliaries. Under the pretense of distress, they were admitted into the lesser port, a gate was opened, and the Latin shout of, Long life and victory to the emperor, John Palaeologus, was answered by a general rising in his favour. A numerous and loyal party yet adhered to the standard of Cantacuzene, but he asserts in his history, does he hope for belief, that his tender conscience rejected the assurance of conquest, that, in free obedience to the voice of religion and philosophy, he descended from the throne, and embraced with pleasure the monastic habit and profession. So soon as he ceased to be a prince, his successor was not unwilling that he should be a saint. The remainder of his life was devoted to piety and learning, in the cells of Constantinople and Mount Athos. 
the monk Joasaph was respected as the temporal and spiritual father of the emperor, and, if he issued from his retreat, it was as the minister of peace, to subdue the obstinacy and solicit the pardon of his rebellious son. Yet in the cloister, the mind of Cantacuzene was still exercised by theological war. He sharpened a controversial pen against the Jews and Mohammedans, and in every state he defended with equal zeal the divine light of Mount Thabor, a memorial question which consummates the religious follies of the Greeks. The fakirs of India and the monks of the Oriental Church were alike persuaded that in the total abstraction of the faculties of the mind and body the purest spirit may ascend to the enjoyment and vision of the deity. The opinion and practices of the monasteries of Mount Athos will be best represented in the words of an abbot who flourished in the eleventh century. When thou art alone in thy cell, says the ascetic teacher, shut thy door and seat thyself in a corner, raise thy mind above all things vain and transitory, recline thy beard and chin on thy breast, turn thy eyes and thy thoughts towards the middle of thy belly, the region of the navel, and search the place of the heart, the seat of the soul. At first all will be dark and comfortless, but if you persevere day and night, you will feel an ineffable joy, and no sooner has the soul discovered the place of the heart than it is involved in a mystic and ethereal light. This light, the production of a distempered fancy, the creature of an empty stomach and an empty brain, was adored by the quietests, as the pure and perfect essence of God himself. And, as long as the folly was confined to Mount Athos, the simple solitaries were not inquisitive how the divine essence could be a material substance, or how an immaterial substance could be perceived by the eyes of the body. But in the reign of the younger Andronicus, these monasteries were visited by Balaam, a Calabrian monk, who was equally skilled in philosophy and theology, who possessed the language of the Greeks and Latins, and whose versatile genius could maintain their opposite creeds, according to the interest of the moment. The indiscretion of an ascetic revealed to the curious traveller the secrets of mental prayer, and Barlaam embraced the opportunity of ridiculing the quietests, who placed the soul in the navel, of accusing the monks of Mount Athos of heresy and blasphemy, his attack compelled the more learned to renounce or dissemble the simple devotion of their brethren. And Gregory Palms introduced a scholastic distinction between the essence and operation of God. His inaccessible essence dwells in the midst of an uncreated and eternal light. And the beatific vision of the saints had been manifested to the disciples of Mount Thabor in the transfiguration of Christ. Yet this distinction could not escape the reproach of polytheism. The eternity of the light of Thabor was fiercely denied. And Barlaam still charged the Palamites with holding two eternal substances, a visible and an invisible God. From the rage of the monks of Mount Athos, who threatened his life, the Calibrian retired to Constantinople, where his smooth and specious manners introduced him to the favour of the great domestic and the emperor. The court and the city were involved in this theological dispute, which flamed amidst the civil war. But the doctrine of Barlaam was disgraced by his flight in apostate. But the doctrine of Barlaam was disgraced by his flight in apostasy. The Palamites triumphed, and their adversary, the patriarch John of Apri, was deposed by the consent of the adverse factions of the state. In the character of emperor and theologian, Cantacuzene presided in the synod of the Greek Church, which established, as an article of faith, the uncreated light of Mount Thabor, and, after so many insults, the reason of mankind was slightly wounded by the addition of a single absurdity. Many rolls of paper or parchment have been blotted, and the impenitent sectaries, who refused to subscribe the orthodox creed, were deprived of the honours of Christian burial. But in the next age the question was forgotten, 
nor can I learn that the axe or the faggot were employed for the extirpation of the Barlamite heresy. For the conclusion of this chapter, I have reserved the Genosi War, which took the throne of Cantacuzene, and betrayed the debility of the Greek Empire. The Genosi, who, after the recovery of Constantinople, was seated in the suburb of Pera or Galata, received that honourable fief from the bounty of the emperor. They were indulged in the use of their laws and magistrates, but they submitted to the duties of vassals and subjects. The forcible word of liegemen was borrowed from the Latin jurisprudence. And their podesta, or chief, before he entered on his office, saluted the emperor with loyal acclamations and vows of fidelity. Genoa sealed a firm alliance with the Greeks, and, in the case of a defensive war, a supply of fifty empty galleys, and a succour of fifty galleys, completely armed and manned, were promised by the Republic to the Empire. In the revival of a naval force, it was the aim of Michael Paleologus to deliver himself from a foreign aid, and his vigorous government contained the Genosi of Galata within those limits which the insolence of wealth and freedom provoked them to exceed. A sailor threatened that they should soon be masters of Constantinople, and slew the Greek who resented this national affront. And an armed vessel, after refusing to salute the palace, was guilty of some acts of piracy in the Black Sea. The countrymen threatened to support their cause, but the long and opened village of Galata was instantly surrounded by the imperial troops, till, in the moment of the assault, the prostrate Genosi implored the clemency of their sovereign. The defenceless situation which secured their obedience exposed them to the attack of their Venetian rivals, who, in the reign of the elder Andronicus, presumed to violate the majesty of the throne. On the approach of their fleets, the Genosi, with their families and effects, retired into the city. Their empty habitations were reduced to ashes, and the feeble prince, who had viewed the destruction of his suburb, expressed his resentment not by arms, but by ambassadors. This misfortune, however, was advantageous to the Genosi, who obtained, and imperceptibly abused, the dangerous license of surrounding Galata with a strong wall, of introducing into the ditch the waters of the sea, of erecting lofty turrets, and of mounting a train of military engines on the rampart. The narrow bounds in which they had been circumscribed were insufficient for the growing colony. Each day they acquired some addition of landed property, and the adjacent hills were covered with their villas and castles, which they joined and protected by new fortifications. The navigation and trade of the Euxin was the patrimony of the Greek emperors, who commanded the narrow entrance, the gates, as it were, of that inland sea. In the reign of Michael Paleologus, their prerogative was acknowledged by the Sultan of Egypt, who solicited and obtained the liberty of sending an annual ship for the purchase of slaves in Circassia and the Lesser Tartary, a liberty pregnant with mischief to the Christian cause, since these youths were transformed by education and discipline into the formidable Mamelukes. From the colony of Pera, the Genosi engaged with superior advantage in the lucrative trade of the Black Sea, and their industry supplied the Greeks with fish and corn, two articles of food almost equally important to a superstitious people. The spontaneous bounty of nature appears to have bestowed the harvests of Ukraine, the produce of a rude and savage husbandry, and the endless exportation of salt fish and caviar is annually renewed by the enormous sturgeons that are caught at the mouth of the Don, or Tanassus. In their last station of the rich mud and shallow waters of the Meotis, the waters of the Oxus, the Caspian, the Volga, and the Don, opened a rare and laborious passage for the gems and spices of India, and after three months' march, the caravans of Charisme met the Italian vessels in the harbours of Crimea. These various branches of trade were monopolised by the diligence and power of the Genosi. Their rivals of Venice and Pisa were forcibly expelled, 
the natives were awed by the castles and cities which arose on the foundations of their humble factories and their principal establishment of kaffa was besieged without effect by the tartar powers destitute of a navy the greeks were oppressed by these haughty merchants who fed or famished constantinople according to their interest they proceeded to usurp the customs the fishery and even the toil of the bosphorus and while they derived from these objectives a revenue of two hundred thousand pieces of gold a remnant of thirty thousand was reluctantly allowed to the emperor the colony of pera or galata acted in peace and war as an independent state and as it will happen in distant settlements the genosi podesta too often forgot that he was the servant of his own masters these usurpations were encouraged by the weakness of the elder andronicus and by the civil wars that affected his age and the minority of his grandson the talents of cantacuzene were employed to the ruin rather than the restoration of the empire and after his domestic victory he was condemned to an ignominious trial whether the greeks or the genoese should reign in constantinople the merchants of pera were offended by his refusal of some contagious land some commanding heights which they proposed to cover with new fortifications and in the absence of the emperor who was detained at demotica by sickness they ventured to brave the debility of a female reign a byzantine vessel which had presumed to fish at the mouth of the harbour was sunk by these audacious strangers the fishermen were murdered instead of suing for pardon the genosi demanded satisfaction required in a haughty strain that the greeks should renounce the exercise of navigation and encourage with regular arms the first sallies of the popular indignation they instantly occupied the debated land and by the labour of a whole people of either sex and of every age the wall was raised and the ditch was sunk with incredible speed at the same time they attacked and burnt two byzantine galleys while the three others the remainder of the imperial navy escaped from their hands the habitation without the gates or along the shore were pillaged and destroyed and the care of the regent of the empress irene was confined to the preservation of the city the return of cantacuzene dispelled the public consternation the emperor inclined to peaceful counsels but he yielded to the obstinacy of his enemies who rejected all reasonable terms and to the ardour of his subjects who threatened in the style of scripture to break them in pieces like a potter's vessel yet they reluctantly paid the taxes that he imposed for the construction of ships and the expenses of the war and as the two nations were masters the one of the land the other of the sea constantinople and pera were pressed by the evils of a mutual siege the merchants of the colony who had believed that a few days would terminate the war already murmured at their losses the succors from their mother country were delayed by the factions of genoa and the most cautious embraced the opportunity of a rhodian vessel to remove their families and effects from the scene of hostility in the spring the byzantine fleet seven galleys and a train of smaller vessels issued from the mouth of the harbour and steered in a single line along the shore of pera unskilfully presenting their sides to the beaks of their adverse squadron the crews were composed of peasants and mechanics nor was their ignorance compensated by the native courage of barbarians the wind was strong the waves were rough and no sooner did the greeks perceive a distant and inactive enemy than they leaped headlong into the sea from a doubtful to an inevitable peril the troops that marched to the attack of the lines of pera were struck at the same moment with a similar panic and the genosi were astonished and almost ashamed at the double victory their triumphant vessels crowned with flowers and dragging after them the captive galleys repeatedly passed and repassed before the palace the only virtue of the emperor was patience and the hope of revenge his sole consolation yet the distress of both parties 
interposed a temporary agreement, and the shame of the empire was disguised by a thin veil of dignity and power. Summoning the chiefs of the colony, Cantacuzene affected to despise the trivial objective of the debate, and, after a mild reproof, most liberally granted the lands, which had been previously reassigned to the seeming custody of his officers. But the emperor was soon solicited to violate the treaty, and to join his arms with the Venetians, the perpetual enemies of Genoa and her colonies. While he compared the reasons of peace and war, his moderation was provoked by a wanton insult of the inhabitants of Pera, who discharged from their rampart a large stone that fell in the midst of Constantinople. On his just complaint, they coldly blamed the imprudence of their engineer, but the next day the insult was repeated, and they exulted in a second proof that the royal city was not beyond the reach of their artillery. Cantacuzene instantly signed his treaty with the Venetians, but the weight of the Roman Empire was scarcely felt in the balance of these opulent and powerful republics. From the Straits of Gibraltar to the mouth of the Tineus, their fleets encountered each other with various success, and a memorial battle was fought in the narrow sea, under the walls of Constantinople. It would not be an easy task to reconcile the accounts of the Greeks, the Venetians, and the Genoese, and while I depend on the narrative of an imperial historian, I shall borrow from each nation the facts that redound to their own disgrace, and the honour of their foes. The Venetians, with their allies the Catalans, had the advantage of numbers, and their fleet, with the poor addition of eight Byzantine galleys, amounted to seventy-five sail. The Genoese did not exceed sixty-four, but in these times their ships of war were distinguished by the superiority of their size and strength. The names and families of their naval commanders, Pisani and Doria, are illustrious in the annals of their country, but the personal merit of the former was eclipsed by the fame and abilities of his rival. They engaged in tempestuous weather, and the tumultuary conflict was continued from the dawn to the extinction of light. The enemies of the Genoese implored their prowess, the friends of the Venetians are dissatisfied with their behaviour, but all parties agree in praising the skill and boldness of the Catalans, who, with many wounds, sustain the brunt of the action. On the separation of the fleets, the event might appear doubtful, but the thirteen Genoese galleys, that had been sunk or taken, were compensated by a double loss of the allies, of fourteen Venetians, ten Catalans, and two Greeks, and even the grief of the conquerors, express the assurance and habit of more decisive victories. Pisani confessed his defeat by retiring into a fortified harbour, from whence, under the pretext of the orders of the Senate, he steered with a broken and flying squadron for the Isle of Candia, and abandoned to his rivals the sovereignty of the sea. In a public epistle addressed to the Dodge and Senate, Petrarch employs his eloquence to reconcile the maritime powers, the two luminaries of Italy. The orator celebrates the valour and victory of the Genoese, the first of men in the exercise of naval war. He drops a tear on the misfortunes of their Venetian brethren, but he exhorts them to pursue with fire and sword the base and perfidious Greeks, to purge the metropolis of the East from the heresy with which it was infected. Deserted by their friends, the Greeks were incapable of resistance, and three months after the battle, the Emperor Cantacuzene solicited and subscribed a treaty, which forever banished the Venetians and Catalans, and granted to the Genoese a monopoly of trade, and almost a right of dominion. The Roman Empire, I smile in transcribing the name, might soon have sunk into a province of Genoa, if the ambition of the Republic had not been checked by the ruin of her freedom and naval power. A long contest of one hundred and thirty years was determined by the triumph of Venice, and the factions of the Genoese compelled them to seek for domestic peace under the protection of a foreign lord, the Duke of Milan, or the French king. 
yet the spirit of commerce survived that of conquest, and the colony of Paris delawed the capital and navigated the Euxine, till it was involved by the Turks in the final servitude of Constantinople itself. End of chapter 63, part 2